Okay, so my presentation today is going to be on environmental politics. And so the first question I'd like to answer is, what is environmental politics? Simply put, environmental politics is an area of study which focuses on how politics affects the environment and how the environment influences politics. According to Neil Carter, unlike most other single issues, it comes replete with its own ideology and political movement. And what that means to me is that this reciprocal relationship is defined by this ideology and political movement because Mother Nature cannot advocate on her own behalf, and it is only through constant pressure placed on politicians by proponents of these beliefs that anything has ever gotten done. In America, environmental politics has gone through three major eras. The first one was the progressive movement the progressive era rather and the conservation movement from the 1890s through 1920s and then we had the modern movement in the 50s through the 80s and whatever where the heck we are in now which I will explain when we get there uh, but first the early history of environmental politics in America begins with settlers and colonists and they were familiar with the concept of the commons, which we studied in this class, and basically says that when resources are limited and held jointly, self-interest says to deplete it. And that's what we did at first, but as the American economy became more nuanced and different, people started to realize that industries such as logging and the deforestation associated with it were having negative impacts on the environment. And then, starting with the book Man and Nature by George Perkins March, written by in 1864, people adopted the idea of the environmental impact method of analysis when it came to these issues. And this view says that we place ourselves in situations, I'm sorry, this view says that when we place ourselves in situations wherein we are damaging the environment, we should choose the way that is least harmful and will have the least lasting impacts. And so moving into the conservation movement and the progressive era, uh, American society shifted with urbanization during the Industrial Revolution, and so hunting and fishing were no longer for necessity and became very popular as trophy sports. This led to the near extinction of many species, and in response to, in response to this overhunting and fishing, Theodore Roosevelt and George Bird Grinnell formed the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887, which consisted of conservationist scientists politicians and intellectuals who were all would meet together and would focus on how to solve the problems of overfishing as well as resource management. Theodore Roosevelt also uh, founded the U.S. Forest Service and nominated the first chief, Gilbert Pinchot. Together they passed the Newlands Reclamation Act of 1902 which promoted federal dams to be built for use by local farmers and placed 230 million acres under federal protection. Theodore Roosevelt also created five national parks, 51 bird preserves, four game preserves, and 150 national forests, which led to him having a very unique legacy as he set aside more federal land for national parks and preserves than all of his predecessors combined. Moving forward, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about John Muir, who is a particularly famous figure in California history as he held the belief that we should try to minimize the commercial use of water and forest resources. His main life's opposition was against the building of the Hetch Hetchy Dam, which was not successful, but he was able to bring awareness to the importance of the preservation of the environment, especially the Yosemite River Valley. And so these two pictures that I have here, uh, the one on the left is the Hetch Hetchy River Valley, and this picture was taken in 1900, uh, before there was a dam, obviously, and on the right is a picture of John Muir. So moving forward, uh, we moved into the beginnings of the modern movement in the 1950s and 60s. And while there were some people, such as uh, President uh, FDR, who used the Department of Agriculture and Interior to end wasteful land use, helped minimize the impact of the Dust Bowl and enveloped resource I'm sorry, and developed resources in the West, uh, America between the 20s and the 50s had lost interest in the conservation of natural resources until the beginning of the modern movement. So during this time, Americans began to become intimately aware of the effects of our actions with the rise of nuclear technology and bombs, oil spills, and scientific advancements that were beginning to show things like air pollution and water pollution were causing harm to us in many different ways. And so the two pictures that I have here, uh, the first one on top is Operation Crossroads in 1954. Um, where an entire 23-man crew of Japanese of the Japanese fishing boat Lucky Dragon were exposed to fallout uh, from this hydrogen bomb test on Bikini Atoll. 
this became very famous and was in a lot of newspapers in America, and we became very um, concerned with the effects of nuclear testing as a result. And on the bottom, we have uh, the Santa Barbara oil spill, which happened in 1969 and dumped 3 million gallons of oil into the ocean. And so, like I said, these things uh, began to bring awareness, uh, to, at least to the American mind, for a lot of the things that we were doing to the to the uh, environment. And so the environment, the modern movement continued through the 70s and 80s, and in the 70s, everyday Americans became involved in environmental politics as a response to things learned in the 50s and 60s. Things such as the Earth Day demonstration of 1970 really showed that it was a social movement and everyone was really concerned, well, beginning to be concerned about the environment and what we were doing to it. So all of this put pressure on politicians to make legislative changes such as the Clean Air Act of 1970, Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, the 1970 National Environmental uh, Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and the Clean Water Act of 1977. Compared to the modern day, we were able to get a lot done in terms of environmental politics in the 70s. However, in the 80s, things were a little different. The focus was on things that were immediate problems. In the beginning of the decade, we passed the Superfund Act in 1980, which set aside funds for the hundreds slash thousands of places affected by the federal government's pollution of toxic waste, such as in the case of the Love Canal, which was a terrible case in which housing was built on a site where toxic chemicals were dumped and improperly contained, and many members of the community were exposed to harmful carcinogenic compounds, which led to the deaths, miscarriages, reproductive defects, and many other ailments of many in the community. In response to the um, environmental movement getting, gaining so much power, however, uh, in the late 80s, Ronald Reagan led an anti-environmental movement by appointing James G. Watt, who was called one of the worst, most blatantly anti-environmental political appointees to be Secretary of the Interior. Together, they were able to allow industry groups to lobby for weakened regulation and successfully portrayed environmental groups as out of touch with the needs of the mainstream culture. Moving forward to the modern day, environmental politics is a tale of two parties that fundamentally disagree on the key facts. This has led to both sides fighting for their own agendas with admittedly mixed results. On the one hand, you have President Trump and the Republicans, as recently as last weekend, saying that climate change, I'm sorry, that the climate change report's findings are false slash misleading, with Trump going as far as to say that he doesn't believe it. The policy implications of his beliefs have been numerous, but some notable ones include the approval of offshore drilling in Alaska, and as well as the appointment of two horrible EPA chiefs in Scott Pruitt, who described himself as, quote, the leading advocate against the EPA's activist agenda, unquote, and now Andrew Wheeler, who is an ex-coal lobbyist. And on the other hand, new Democratic representatives who mirror the U.S. population in terms of social and ethnic diversity, such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York, are fighting for environmental politics with their own agenda. One of the things that she and others have proposed is called the Green New Deal, and the Green New Deal includes many protections for the environment, including transitioning the U.S. economy to be carbon neutral and lofty 10-year goals, such as 100% of power generation from renewable sources, building a smart grid, decarbonizing major uh, industries such as agriculture, uh, transportation, and manufacturing, and making the United States the largest exporter of green technology. And so hopefully, um, from my perspective, I hope that that deal is able to get passed and we're able to move forward into the next stage of the future and continue our environmental stewardship and hopefully change the face of environmental politics to be a better one than it currently is. And that's the end of my presentation. Here are all my sources, and thank you very much.